And now it's my pleasure to present um, Dr. Haas to you uh, from um, the company um, uh, BioNTech RNA, uh, who is going to give an update on the clinical translation of um, their approaches for RNA nanomedicines. I saw him earlier this year at the, um, the sRNA conference in, um, in London, and I'm very curious to hear about the update so far. So, yes, so thank you very much for this kind introduction. I would also like to thank the organizers for inviting us to give uh, an update on our uh, progress with this development pipeline. So I would also like to thank you for coming to this presentation. Um, what I'm talking about is um, RNA nanomedicines for application in, in, in tumor in, immunotherapy, uh, where we have developed a new uh, technology, which has entered uh, more or less one year from now uh, uh, the uh, stage of clinical trials, and I can give you some introduction into the uh, technology and the, the, the update, uh, the clinical outcome so far. This is a project um, uh, which came out from a close cooperation between the Mainz University, uh, Tron, which is a non-profit research organization uh, in Mainz, Germany, and uh, BioNTech, which is a spin-out from uh, the Mainz University, um, founded uh, uh, not such a long time ago, 2008, but actually we are not so small uh, anymore, and we are uh, having a rather complex company structure. Um, I won't go into details. The bottom line is this is all related in one way or the other to uh, tumor therapy, immunology, RNA-based, uh, messenger RNA-based therapies with branches in diagnostics and, and therapeutics. And we do have also uh, production sites for GMP manufacturing of our compounds. Um, the, the fundamental idea is to use messenger RNA for uh, tumor vaccination. So instead of using uh, antigens for vaccination as in classical vaccination for, uh, for, for infections, we, we use messenger RNA that codes uh, for, the, for the tumor antigens. And therefore, this uh, RNA has to be delivered to antigen-presenting cells to trigger the immune response. If this happens, a whole cascade of different types of uh, 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 immunological responses is, is triggered both systemic immune responses and specific immune responses towards uh, the antigens uh, uh, for which we have uh, vaccinated. And therefore, uh, one of the key tasks for such a um, development is to enable efficient delivery of the uh, RNA into the target cells, which must be in one way or the other antigen presenting cells. Um, there are different ways to do it. Um, I would like to talk today only on, on uh, messenger RNA uh, uh, nanoparticle formulations uh, for the reasons of this conference. Uh, and these are RNA nanoplex, uh, lipoplex nanoparticles formed from RNA and liposomes. Uh, they uh, don't look exactly as shown, I have to take the other one, as shown here in this cartoon. Uh, actually, what we get is kind of globular compact uh, particles with the uh, internal lamella-like organization, which are uh, globular but not really spherical. Uh, I used to call them potatoes, uh, um, but uh, you are free to have uh, own ideas. Anyway, we make them in defined size and characteristics, uh, enabling intravenous injection. And with these particles, we can target different organs uh, after, uh, after in intravenous injection. Um, this slide is just to show uh, in, 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 in one glimpse the, uh, the, the basic principle. What we simply do is we, we uh, incubate uh, positively charged liposomes and RNA in different charge ratios. We get defined particles with uh, suitable particle sizes for uh, uh, parental application. And we find that these particles uh, protect the RNA from degradation. They uh, enable delivery to certain organs. And by uh, changing the uh, charge ratio between the positively charged uh, liposome and the negatively charged RNA, we can direct and fine tune uh, the, the, the targeting expression profile towards certain organs. Here you see that uh, an example where we can switch between uh, lung targeting 
uh, in the case that we do have an excess of uh, positively charged liposomes towards spleen targeting in the case that we do have an excess of negatively charged RNA. So it's a very simple and straightforward principle uh, and it has several advantages. One of the advantages is that it is uh, applicable to any kind of lipid. It's not required to have a complicated lipid, which uh, uh, is the only one that works. It's a generic principle. And um, here uh, you see uh, a view graph of size measurements, just as a, as a representative image, what comes out. We can make particles uh, with uh, lipids and, and um, uh, liposomes and, and RNA, which are uh, confined in size in case uh, that one of the moieties uh, is present in excess in the charge equilibrium range, uh, the, the, the size diverges and the, the zeta potential, the charge of the particle switches. This can be uh, reproduced with, with all kinds of, of combination of lipids. Here you see some standard lipids that are known to everybody in the field. They are the most boring lipids uh, in, in principle, but they have the advantage that they are commercially available in GMP grade, and they facilitate, for example, uh, clinical development. Uh, we heard two or one day ago uh, the uh, presentations which stressed the, uh, the, the complexity of pharmaceutical development. And uh, uh, one bottom line which I would uh, underline is uh, keep it simple. And we are uh, uh, in grade to use this, this uh, um, standard lipids in order to construct our, our carriers for RNA delivery. So it's more kind of a particle engineering story. And here, this is an extract from uh, our recent paper in Nature. The, this slide is very busy because you see many different things uh, at the same time. But in principle, it shows using lipids you saw in the slide before that in all cases, you can make the stable particles. The particle uh, size is uh, confined if there's an excess of negative uh, or positive charge and uh, uh, the, the zeta potential switches. And on uh, intravenous injection, we always see that we can redirect uh, the, uh, the maximum of expression profile from one type of organ to the others. And uh, on this basis, we can uh, select the most suitable, uh, most compliant lipids for, for pharmaceutical development for, for our project. Just um, um, two more slides to show a little bit of technology before I switch to, uh, to clinical development. For our first studies, uh, we decided to have a kit approach for uh, providing uh, the um, uh, study medication uh, to, to, to the hospitals consisting of uh, RNA, a diluent, and um, uh, liposomes, which are combined to each other just prior to administration to the patient. Also, this has uh, advantages in terms of development speed, and it takes out complexity because we do not have to develop the uh, uh, protocol for manufacturing the ready-to-use product. However, we do also develop uh, these ready use products for our subsequent uh, uh, um, uh, um, personalized um, medications where we uh, uh, product the uh, manufacture the, the RNA lipoplexis in a batch manner, which then can be stored in the liquid phase or in frozen state or in a dehydrated state in order to maintain the required uh, shelf life for the respective administrations, uh, for the respective applications. And this is uh, an overview on our, um, on our uh, clinical approaches to use uh, this concept for treating patients. There's basically three different types of, of uh, 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 vaccinations, which we call FIXVAC, uh, uh, warehouse approach, and MUTAM approach. Uh, which uh, uh, are different in, in, in uh, personalization, individualization with, with respect to the patients. With a fixed VAC uh, protocol, I have to change again, uh, uh, patients receive uh, defined uh, uh, RNAs, which uh, code for defined antigens, which are shared by the whole patient community. Uh, so this is a large batch production. In the warehouse approach, uh, we manufacture a warehouse, how we call it, of, of usually uh, expressed uh, antigens in a certain indications. And uh, patients are screened and they receive the medication only for which they are positive for. Uh, so uh, as an example, uh, of a, out of a warehouse of 30 different uh, antigen RNAs, we select four 
the four ones we, for which the, uh, the patients are most positive of. And in the IVAC mutanome approach, this is a strictly personalized approach based on um, uh, sequencing of, um, of tumor biopsies in comparison to healthy tissue, identification of antigenic mutations, and then manufacturing of personalized medications for each individual patient. I would uh, like to uh, go to the uh, 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 lipomerate study, which was our first uh, clinical study with, with, with uh, um, RNA lipoplexin under particle formulation. This is a fixed VAC uh, uh, approach uh, for our uh, application in uh, uh, malignant melanoma. Patients receive uh, a combination of four different uh, tumor, coding, uh, tumor antigen coding RNAs. Uh, in, in a sequence as, a, as intravenous injections, um, where we have a study plan which uh, rough, looks uh, roughly like that. So uh, importantly, uh, we have a, a, a dose escalation phase, and you see that we start up with uh, very small doses of total RNA per patient. So the, the, the starting dose of, of RNA is 7.2 micrograms per, dose per patient. This is below the level we use for the, the, the application in preclinical models. Uh, aim is to uh, investigate safety, uh, uh, tolerability, biological efficacy uh, in, in four different centers in Germany. Uh, we have a, a dose es escalation uh, approach with an extensive uh, biomarker research uh, program where the first cohort of the lowest dose is already completed. And here, we can look uh, at some, some uh, first results where uh, we get indication for both uh, systemic and also specific Im uh, immune response after the vaccination. So um, uh, at the left side, you see an increase of interferon alpha e expression after vaccination. So that's a systemic response uh, uh, as usual for, for vaccinations. But we can also prove that the levels uh, of the uh, uh, of, 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 of the titers for, for, the, for the antigen increases after vaccination. So even after this very low doses we administered in, in the initial phase, we saw already indication that this vaccination works. We saw the, the typical signs of vaccination. And um, summarizing, uh, what we can say is that all these doses so far were well tolerated. Uh, what we get is uh, Typical signs of vaccination, like a vaccination for any kind of uh, infection, so like uh, elevated temperature on the on, which can be uh, easily uh, con controlled. Uh, we see a certain variation in, in, in the response, which may be uh, interpatient uh, response, depending on uh, individual uh, uh, TLR functions in the, uh, in the patients. We see a dose-dependent response of, of, uh, um, of cytokines like interferon alpha, and we see also response in the uh, antigen-specific T cells, both uh, de novo and amplification of already present ones. And we would conclude that uh, the clinical data support fully our understanding from the preclinical research uh, we did so far. So um, overall, um, this is, according to our standing, a very promising technology platform which enables us to bring uh, several uh, uh, new um, uh, tumor vaccine uh, therapies into, in, into clinical development. And uh, we think that this is also a technology which is suitable to bring these uh, uh, products uh, into clinical practice uh, at later stages. And with that, I would like to thank some of the cooperators. Uh, uh, more of them are on, on, on the paper, which I mentioned. And I would like to thank you for the uh, attention. And I'm happy to take questions if there are some. Questions. Um. Do you know the mechanism for this strange biodistribution, and do you know if uh, you have a similar biodistribution in humans as in animals? Um, yes, we have an idea on the mechanism. Uh, we don't have uh, absolute data on the biodistribution in humans. We have it on from different animals. Importantly. What I showed you was the profile of RNA expression, and this is different from the profile of 
delivery of the physical delivery of the vehicle. So I, sh I showed you that there's no expression at all in the liver. However, as this is a lipid-based formulation, uh, we measure that uh, a certain part of the injected dose ends up in the liver, but that's not active. So uh, our uh, mode of action is a combination from having uh, vehicles that are functional for a certain type of uh, cells and the modulation of physical targeting uh, on the basis of charge ratios. The um, expression profile in cell types can be modulated by selecting individual lipids. We know that some lipid components are better for this type of cells than some uh, for, for the other ones. And um, physical targeting is driven by the fact that um, usual cells normally need brute force to take up uh, DNA or RNA for transfection. So therefore, conventional transfection vehicles are positively charged. They interact by electrostatic interactions with the membrane and somehow breach the membrane by... Um, still to be defined mechanisms. In our case, there's no attractive interaction between, uh, uh, between the cells and, and, and the vehicle. So this means this is due to an, an active uptake mechanism of the cells where, however, it is provided that after uptake, uh, the transfection agents are still functioning and the RNA is able to code for the, uh, for, for the antigen. Taking all of this together, we got our selectivity. So the one key driving force is electrostatics, but there are some other technological parameters which add up to get this uh, selectivity profile. Maybe because of the time we continue, but thanks yes. to Dr. House once again for your presentation.